<laughs> We're an interesting bunch. <laughs> okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name's Kirsty, and I am uh, a follower of Jesus Christ. I am a daughter of the King, and I am absolutely delighted to be here with you guys tonight. Uh, thank you so much for asking me to come over. Um, I just want to get it out of the way. I'm nervous, <laughs> right? I just want to say that, okay? Um, I always feel the burden of responsibility when han handling God's word, speaking out God's word, or shepherding God's people in any way, shape, or form. So, you know, the, um, the weight of that responsibility is not lost on me this evening. Um, however, you know, I said it at the Believers in Recovery Conference, and I'll say it again now, my obedience is greater than my fear. Amen. My obedience is greater than my fear, so here I am. <laughs> uh, I just want to say uh, thank you to, you know, my Believers in Recovery family who've come and supported, and I know that... Uh, Ale Alex Lamb is uh, watching on YouTube as well. Uh, he's not well this evening, couldn't be with us, but uh, get well soon, Alex, and thank you. Okay, so, covered. So, I, uh, you know, when, when I had the conversation about potentially coming and speaking here, I spent uh, some time in prayer. And uh, first and foremost, I, you know, the Holy Spirit, what is it that you want me to say? I am nothing but a vessel here this evening what is it that I need to say? And, um, and I'm going to weave, or try, Psalm 91 with the theme of the conference covered and also with just a little bit of my testimony and what God has done in and through me, right? And um, so the Holy Spirit, I believe, gave me um, an acronym for covered that I'm going to walk you through. And, um, and the idea is, is that at the end of it, we have that better sense of how to move into that secret place. So many of us know about the secret place and spend very little time there, yeah. right? So, you know, I'm, I'm gonna talk you through some stuff and, and, and talk you through how God has moved in my life and how, how do I come to the secret place and what does that actually look like and does the secret place have to be really secret? You know, how does a person get there? If it's secret, you know, what does that look like? Um, you know, the, the, the first letter of the word covered is C. And I think before we do anything else, we must remember that as saved, sanctified, set free, Bible-believing Christians, we are co-heirs. We are co-heirs, right? And um, so, you know, what are we... What are we saved for? Romans talks about um, if we are children, when, then we are heirs. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory, right? And, um, you know, I, I, I've got to be honest, I don't always feel like a co-heir. Thank God for God's word. Because if I went by my feelings, uh, my life would be in a real mess. Fact, absolute fact. You know, God's word tells me that I am a co-heir. Do I walk like a co-heir? Do I walk like the daughter of a king? Right, that's, that's some kind of royalty. Does my life look like that? And it's, it's really easy for somebody to stand up here and say, we should, we must, we will, we can. I appreciate that, right? I appreciate that, you know, yeah, I can throw out a million and one scriptures and say, you know, you, we should walk like co-heirs and it should look like this. And s some days you get up in the morning and it just doesn't feel like that. I don't feel like a co-heir today, Lord, yeah. right? Thank God he sent me a helper, right? I don't have to walk in daughtership in and of my own strength. He sent me a helper, why? Because he foreknew. Yeah. He knew every ounce of weakness that was gonna be within my flesh. Once I was saved, set free, and sanctified, right after the fact, he knew that on some days, with, with my history and where I've come from, and I, I come from the gutter, there's no other way to describe where I come from than that. 
that there were going to be days where it was hard for me to believe that I had been truly restored into right relationship, that that would always be the thing that the enemy was going to attack in me. Why would he save you? Why would he save you? You are lower than the foolish things of this world. You were a dog in the gutter. Why would the risen King Christ save you? I needed a helper to unravel some of those lies, right? Which is exactly what they are. I couldn't have done that in and of myself. Why? Because I didn't feel like it was true. So the, you know, the first thing about covered is remember that we are co-heirs. And Psalm 91 talks about uh, the shadow of the Most High, right? And there's, there's a clue, okay? So we are to rest in the shadow of the Most High. Now, if you're going to rest in a shadow, usually if light casts a shadow, the shadow is very close to the thing, to the source of light. If we are to rest in his shadow, we must be close in proximity with him. And again, that sounds like one of those really simple things that somebody can stand up here and say, right? But what does, you, if I asked you to, to carve up your day, in terms of time, and apportion it and ascertain the amount that goes to the Lord versus the amount that goes to some of the things of this world, how would it look? You know, and I've done time inventories. So I've done time in inventories where I've sat down and I've actually looked at, does my time look like I worship with my time? Is that actually reflected in my time? You know, am I creating proximity to him? Am I in closeness through how I spend my time? You know, it, like I said, you know, lots of us know about the secret place. We don't always spend a great deal of time in it. There is no barrier to the secret place now for us. There is the veil torn, right? The, the death of Jesus Christ dealt with that for us. There's, I would never have made it anywhere near the Holy of Holies. And we all know what would have happened if I would have tried, right? It not, it's a bad ending, right? I would never have made it anywhere near that. Jesus Christ died so that I could. Why would I not? Why would I not do that with my time? What does my time look like? I am the daughter of a king who died on a cross to save me. Does it look like that? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So that's, that's the truth, that's the reality. You know, if we're gonna rest in that shadow, one, time, 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 spend time. Make him the author and the finisher of your time, not just your faith. He gave you 24 hours in a day. He did. How, how much of them do you give back? To him, we were talking about offerings, right? We don't, just, we don't just give in money, we give in time, treasures, and talents. Yeah. Three things. Does my time look like that? Does my time create the proximity that I need to sit in his shadow? You know, um, <clears throat> Ephesians talks about, um, Ephesians talks about lots of things, but in Ephesians 2 specifically, uh, it talks about in Christ Jesus, us who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So the blood of Christ which was spilled before the day you were born was, was spilled ahead of time so that you could be brought near. Yeah. It's already been spilled so that you can. Why would we not? Yeah. Why would we not? You know, the, the, in the story of the prodigal son, one of the thing that stands out to me most about that whole um, story is the line where it says, and whilst he was still far away, yeah. his father, right? So, so here's the thing. I, I need to move towards that shadow. But even if I'm nowhere near it, he will come to me. You know, and I, I don't know, I feel like that's for somebody today. And I don't often get kind of senses like that. But there are times where we can be saved a long time, walking with the Lord a long time. 
and go through what I call the ministry of the wilderness. Those times where we're walking and we can't see him, we can't feel him, we can't hear him, we, don't, we can feel separated from him, right? You know, th those times come, they, they come. It, I, I believe he ministers to us in it, right? But if we don't set our feet in the direction of him, if we're not even walking back towards the secret place, we're not responding to the gift of the gospel. So we're, we're, you know, in Believers in Recovery, we, we have a, a saying, it's not, it's not just from us, but we talk about being a safe to serve, not safe to sit. You know, and, and it, that brings me to the next piece in the, in the acronym. The O in COVID is for obvious. So and there's a, a, a famous preacher who, and I, I love this story, he talks about having an encounter with a truck or a lorry, right? So if I'm walking down the road and I have an encounter with a truck, the physical markers of that encounter will be all over my body. It will be unmistakable that I, Kirsty, have had an encounter with a truck. Yeah? yeah? Right. Jesus Christ is bigger than any truck on this planet. If you have had an encounter with Jesus Christ, you should wear the markers of it all over, all over your body, all over your mind, all over your time, all over your treasures, all over your talents, all over your feet, all over your heart. Every single arena and area of your life should bear the marker of that encounter. If we are gonna come close to him, it has to be obvious. It has to be obvious. It will always be obvious. You can't come anywhere near the risen king and it not be obvious. It can't, you know, we're changed as a result of that. It doesn't look the same as it did before. And do you think when I was sat in a crack house 17 years ago that I ever thought that he would do this? There's no psychedelic drug made that could, that could put that dream into my mind. Only Christ could take me from the crack house to the church to hear only Christ, only Christ. You know, and, and you know, that, it, that's, that's the obvious marker. It's not, it's not just because I'm here, I'm, it's because I'm, I'm, I'm where I am when no one's looking. I'm who I am when no one's looking. I, I am as sanctified in front of everybody as I am when my door is closed at home. Yeah. Okay, I'm not a Sunday morning sanctified kind of person, right? I am a 24-7, 365, saved, set free, sanctified believer is what I am. You know, and a great question about, you know, is it obvious? Is, it, is there an obvious marker? Does your faith just, does it just turn inwards or does it spill out of you and drown everybody around you? If you were arrested today, for being a believer in Jesus Christ, would there be enough evidence to convict you beyond a reasonable yeah. doubt? If they look through your social media, would they know? If they look through your telephone call history, would they know? If they look through your Google Maps history, would they know? Would they know? Is it obvious? Is it obvious? You know, we're called to be salt and light. We're called to be salt and light. We're not meant to be the same as the world. Our Google Maps is supposed to say, I'm a believer. Yeah. My social media is supposed to say, I'm a believer. I'm a follower of Christ. My conversations are supposed to say, I'm a believer, I'm a follower of Christ. Everything I do, everywhere I go should say it non-verbally. Yeah. Non you know, yeah. preach the gospel, and if you absolutely have to, use words. Right? If you absolute, that's your last resort, not your first. They should know. How many times have you encountered people who haven't encountered Christ and they come to you and they say, what is it about you? Yeah. I don't know what that, I don't know, I'm not quite sure what that is, but there's something about you. When we're in the world, but we are not of it. And when we are not of it, it is obvious. It's obvious. You know, we can't change or influence something unless we look different than it. Yeah. 
Okay, that's what makes that what makes Christ shine out through us when we don't look the same as everybody else. And that the reality is this: in our modern society today, it shouldn't be difficult. We're living in a lost and broken world. It shouldn't be difficult for us to stand out as his without words. With the, our, our world is, I don't even know what he must think. I really don't. Okay. So the next, you know, letter in the acronym is V, victorious. So here's the thing. We are in spiritual warfare. There is an enemy. If you didn't know, he's been present since, since you know, the time of Eden, since Genesis. He uses the same schemes, same schemes, and I'll talk to you about some of those in a minute. Our God is the defeater of death, the risen king, and the victorious one, right? And if this spiritual battle that we're in if it was a, an actual fleshly, like flesh and blood war, like kind of like Braveheart or something, <laughs> right? I just want you to think about this, right? Because think about the beauty of the sound of our worship earlier, right? If we were fighting this battle in flesh and blood, how far would the victory cry for what was accomplished on the cross travel how far would that victory cry you know we worship in you know hard but do our lives look like a living victory cry do they look like a living victory cry is your life a living victory cry that battle has been won it's been won do you live your life like you were on the winning side do you live your life like you were on the winning side? You know, it, it, Psalm 91 talks about that refuge, right? And if you, you know, if you look for the meaning of the word refuge, it is shelter or protection from something, yeah. right? Shelter or protection from something. So, you know, that battle has been won and we are, you know, we are on the winning side, victorious through him, in him, for him. Does my life look like a living victory cry? You know, like I said, brought from a crack house to this crazy place today. I can't, you know, wow. Here's how God made my life look like a living victory cry. You know, I, I grew up in, um, in a household with two addict parents, right? So I, I, I didn't have very good odds kind of from the start, yeah? It, I wasn't kind of... But I tell you what we did do. Every Sunday morning, we got suited up and we went to church, right? And then the rest of the week, we lived in the absolute pit, is where we lived. You know, and I grew up in the care system and you know, million and one different things. Me and Vicky had a really a powerful conversation earlier. Every form of worldly depravity that one human being can inflict upon another, I was a recipient of. And when God took me, pulled me, plucked me out of that absolute swamp, do you think for a single second that I was not going to do an absolute brave heart style war cry of thanks? Of course I was. Of course I was. And then what was I going to do? I was going to let it guide my footsteps. Do you think I feel qualified to stand here and do this? No, I don't. I don't. I don't, I've not, you know, I feel like I should have gone and spent 20 years in college or something, learning something about something about something that would have qualified me to come here and do this today. I don't, I don't feel like that, but my life needs to be a living victory cry because he didn't pull me out of it for nothing. You know, and I don't know what your pit was. I don't know where you were plucked from or pulled from. He pulled most of us from somewhere, right? What for? You know what you've been saved from. Do you know what you've been saved for? Yeah. 
So many of us get, you know, kind of held up and twisted up and made small by lies. There's a liar. There is a liar. Father of lies that has the power to just slow a believer down a little. Because why would they listen to you? You're a crackhead prostitute. Why would they listen to you? Because I may have been that, but I am more than a conqueror. Made new, set free, redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, listen, the enemy, okay, wants nothing more than for you to stay sat in your seat living a defeated life as a sanctified, set free, and saved believer, right? So, you know, those lies, they're going to happen. They're not going to stop. They're not going to stop. So I just want to give you a little bit of encouragement, and that brings us to the E in, in V, you know. Sometimes, you know, we can come to church for a, a long period of time and go to lots of places. We listen to lots of things. And we don't hear the gospel. Sometimes we don't hear the simple gospel. So I want to give you some encouragement that is the simple gospel. Jesus Christ came to this earth. We were separated, right? If you want to know a little bit more about that, this whole thing went down in Genesis 3 with Eve and a serpent. And yeah, it went great. Jesus came because there weren't enough cows and bulls and offerings that we could make. There weren't enough. We'd have wiped out the whole livestock population of the globe before we would have been restored properly, righteously with God. He had to send his son, right? And if you're sat here and there is any doubt in your heart and mind or you don't know who he is, right? He is the son of God and he was sent for you, for you. If he, can, if he can come for me, you know, it, it says God uses the foolish, thing of this, foolish things of this world, right? More than foolish, more than foolish. God is the potter and we are the, the clay. I was a shattered pot, shattered. If he came for me, it's highly likely he came for you. You can't be too bad. You can't be too lost. You can't be too broken. You can't be too far gone for the love of Jesus Christ. I'm sorry you can't. That blood was shed on the cross for you so that you could be in right relationship with him. And here's the great news, right? Here's the great news. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. But it's a provision that was made for you anyway. 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 Right? You don't have to go and draw any money out of your bank. You don't have to enter into negotiations with anybody. And you definitely don't start have, you don't have to wait until you get good to get it. If you wait until you get good, you'll be waiting for the rest of your life. Right? I learned that. I tried. I tried really hard. Uh, And then I realized that I can't, and I can't in my own strength. It's the spirit that dwells in me. Okay. I just want you to remember, I don't want you to forget the cross because sometimes in the bustle of life and in, you know, trying to, okay, I'm trying to juggle tithing and work and family and parent and motherhood and oh, all of these, like, don't forget the cross because nothing sustains us like it. How many times have we done that? And we've all done it multiple times, I'm sure, where, you know, everything just gets too much and then we just go into that secret place and sit, and it's like sitting at the foot of the cross and just experience that sweet restoration that is him. Amen. There is nothing like it. We were having a conversation earlier, and my friend was saying that um, when she worships and she's on her own at home, there's this really beautiful feeling that she experiences. This, we just, she just has this encounter And I said to her, it's because you're doing what you were created for. 
right? We were created to come into that secret place. We were created for it. it took us a bit of a while to get there, you know, because of that whole Genesis 3 thing. But, you know, because of Jesus Christ, we got there in the end. We got there in the end. The next thing, the next uh, letter is R, uh, it's redemption. Remember your testimony. What has he redeemed you from? Right? Sometimes when we get, you know, we're walking it out and we're walking it out and we're walking it out, it can get very difficult to remember to just stop, turn around. What has he redeemed you from? And it doesn't have to be crack houses and really dramatic things like that. There are some more foolish ones of us than that that need plucking from those places. But it doesn't have to look like that. What has he restored you from? If, yeah, what has he restored you from? And sometimes it's really important for us to think about just how bad that separation was and, and just what, what it felt like to live and walk a life without Christ. If you remember that and if you remember the depth of your sin, you know and are reminded about just how badly you needed a saviour. Right? And when you know how badly you need a savior, then you understand the value of your ransom. When you understand the value of your ransom, your walk becomes a thousand percent more victorious. Because you were valuable enough that God sent his son to die. That's how valuable you are. That's how valuable you are. He redeemed you. You are redeemed. So if I can go from, so I'll just, I'll just share uh, quickly. I had been in a relationship for nine years, living uh, by biblical standards in sin. Um, prior to, it wasn't nine years, it was a little bit less than that, sorry. Prior to coming to Christ. And there's this whole thing about, um, about God's word. And he's kind of got some things to say about that. And he kind of wasn't okay with it. And I, I was convicted, right? Me and my then partner, now husband, were convicted that after nine years of sin together, that we were gonna live right by the Lord, move into separate bedrooms, and almost do the whole thing as if we were brand new to each other, right? Now, what ended that was our wedding day, right? So we got married a year down the line, a year later. And I, me, prostitute, abused, battered, beaten, lost, broken, molested, you name it, I've been through it. In that year of obedience and faith and walking out that redemption, the sanctification process took place on my wedding day. I was as white as my dress. I walked down that aisle with that, that old, the old is gone gone and it was gone you know and I work professionally I work in the field of trauma and therapy and those kind of things I've done a lot of that stuff nothing cut it like Christ yeah. nothing cut it like I'd spent a lot of years talking to a lot of people about a lot of things right that year of okay God this is how you say you want me to walk I'm gonna walk that way I'm gonna walk that way I'm gonna walk that way and it's, it's not easy to undo nine years of behavior it's not, it, you know, it, it was weird. It was like being in a relationship with a new person that I, that I hadn't met. You know, but to honor him, right? When I talk about obvious earlier on, that made it obvious. That made it very obvious. You know, people, my friends, they're like, are you, you, are you okay? Are you feeling it? Like, what happened? What? Jesus Christ happened. That's what happened. God's word happened. That's what, I, I couldn't ignore it. I could, and isn't it funny, because sometimes we try and do that, right? You know, we read something and it's like, no, no, I didn't read that. I didn't, it didn't say that, it didn't say that, it didn't say that. And when God is knocking on your heart, yeah. he will keep knocking, 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 and knocking. And that's what happened. So the next bit I want to speak to you about is endurance. This is not an easy race to run. It is a marathon, not a sprint. It's not a sprint. You know, and I, I think that's a mistake I made early on. I, I, um, I encountered Christ and I was like, 
once you know, you can never go back to not knowing. This is, I have encountered the risen king. It's all going to be amazing. And then I did nothing and struggled. That's pretty much what happened. You know, I, I didn't realize that this is a marathon, right? This is a marathon until we know where we're going, right? We know what the end game looks like. Um, but I didn't prepare for the marathon at all. I was prepared for a little sprint, okay? You know, I got fatigued really quickly. I didn't prepare at all. I didn't, um, I did some training the other day with um, uh, a chap who's the performance director for uh, the Olympic cycling team. And he was talking about some of the, some of the stuff they do to get these athletes to perform at that kind of elite marathon type level. And he was saying they, they do three simple things. So yeah, they've got that, you know, they've got all the kit under the sun to work out every statistic you would ever possibly need to know. And he said when he, he came on board and started looking after this team, he scrapped it all. And he just said to them, we need to get three things right. Um, the first thing was eating right, okay? Now for us as believers, um, eating right means making sure that we're getting nutritious food. Right? So what does that look like? What does that look like? Am I an adult still drinking spiritual milk? Okay, now here's the problem. Spiritual milk cannot sustain the body of an adult. It cannot, yeah? Am I, you know, am I missing out on the absolute banquet that is the word of God by drinking milk or chewing regurgitated food from others? Am I chewing on me? Is, is somebody else doing all the Bible study that I should be doing? Is somebody, right? Am, am I living consistently on the, 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 the Bible study, the preaches, the teaches, the sermons of others? Or am I actually physically preparing myself to receive that nutrition by sitting on my own seat at the table? Am I waiting for the scraps of somebody else's salvation or am I sitting at the sea myself and getting my own nutrition? Am I, am I feeding myself or am I still bottle fed, yeah. right? Which is, which is fine if you're a baby. Yeah. If you're a baby, it's fine. You can't hold up a bottle. You just don't know what you're doing. Milk goes everywhere, all gets messy. And you know, as a baby, what do we do? We spit milk in people's faces quite a lot also, right? <laughs> Are you an adult spiritually still spitting milk in other people's faces? Right? I, I, I spot you got it kind of deal, okay? <laughs> these, these are hard one lessons, trust me, okay? Do you have your own relationship with the food of the good news? The second thing he said was train hard. Like, are we actually prepared for the battle that is to come? And I'm not just talking about our Ephesians armor, right? I'm not just talking about our Ephesians armor. But one, do we understand that there is a war? Do we understand that there is, you know, that we're, we're not fighting against flesh and blood? Do, do you understand that there is a spiritual battle? Is your armor dented? Is your armor dented? Or do you show up with a crisp new breastplate, some blinging shoes, <laughs> right? A nice shiny helmet. Is your armor dented? If your armor is dented, it is a sign that you have endured in battle. So our armor should be a little crooked. There should be a little, you know, it, it should look a little like that. Battle-tested warriors have dented armor. Who are you taking your tactical advice from? Okay, who's leading you into battle? Who are you taking? Don't take tactical advice from someone who is not proficient in battle, right? The most able source of information is God's word itself. You know, and God puts a whole stop of people around you who are battle-tested. Some of them will be battle-weary also. Don't take tactical advice from an individual not equipped. And who are you going to war with? I just have that vision of Moses and Aaron and, you know, who's holding up your arms when the battle is fatiguing you? Who is doing that? Who are you? You know, are you trying to walk this, walk this battle out, walk this race alone? Who is holding you up when you are fatigued? Training hard sometimes looks like an ownership of our shortcomings. It doesn't just look like rocking up on a Sunday with a polished outside. It looks like preparing for battle the rest of the week. 
The third thing was sleep well. Really simple. Eat, eat right, train hard, sleep well. If we're you know, all spiritually fit and we're ready to go and our armor's all battle tested, but we know it's gonna do the job and we're not, you know, we're not eating other people's food and nobody else is giving us nutrition, we're getting direct nutrition ourselves and we're able to feed ourselves and all that good stuff, amazing, wonderful, great. What can make the difference between um, victory and loss in a battle? What do most warriors do the night before a big battle? Rest. Rest, right? It is um, the easiest way that the enemy can fatigue us before, before a fight, before a battle. Keep us busy doing nothing. Absolutely flat out busy doing nothing at all, right? He wants to keep us on our feet when we should be sheltering in Christ. So there are times to fight. There are times to polish armor. There are times to feed. There are times to eat, but there are times to rest. There are times where the greatest defense is nothing. Just sit and rest and be with him. It has to look like that sometimes. So, you know, some of it, we're, okay, I'm, re- I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Like, rest, rest, replenish, restore through him. That is the only way in the morning when all the training and everything else all comes together that you're going to be able to sustain the battle so no one to rest. Question. Is there anything that is taking up the time that should be used in your life, in my life, to shelter in him? And if it is, what is it? Why is that happening? Where are you getting robbed of your rest? What is pulling on your time strings and costing you your rest? The D is for depth. If we want to experience the true thirst quenching proximity with Christ, we cannot be believers who do not know him through his word. The depth of knowledge we have of who he is, is the assurance given that his grace is sufficient for us in all circumstances, in all trials, in all tribulations, in all seasons, for all time. We are always in a position to trade the depth of a relationship with Christ for you know different darts of the enemy. There are four major ones of them. I spoke about these at the Believers Conference, deception, doubt, debate, and division. They're the four most common darts of the enemy. They were present in Eden. They were present in the dialogue with Eve. Deception, doubt, debate, and division. Four darts that have the power to keep a believer moving nowhere fast. We, we cannot trade depth for those darts. But the enemy will always check in to see if we are ready to check out. Always. Sometimes, you know, we can spend a, a lot of time, you know, and I, I have absolutely been guilty of this. Um, getting into wasting my time, debating parts of faith with people, other people, who are already saved. (laughs) How smart of the enemy to keep me arguing with my brothers and sisters who I have no business getting into a theological debate with someone who's already saved. But it's a great way to keep me busy. Keep me busy because who of the unbelievers around me lost out because of that time I wasted over there, right? Nice and simple, keep us on our toes. If the the, uh, enemy wants to keep us deceived, really simple way to do it, keep us out of God's word. It's the simplest way to deceive a believer. Keep them out of God's word and give them second, third, fourth, fifth, and tenth hand information about what the word says. We are easy to deceive when we do not know what his word says easy to deceive. You know, and, and, and in this exact same pattern, right? And, and in modern day times, I feel like maybe, you know, we, we fall into the same trap as Eve did when he said, did God really say? Right? But our version of it now is, 
even in 2022? <laughs> even now? Yeah. That was way all that time ago. Yeah. Surely we don't have to do that now. Like, what does the 2022 version of the gospel say? It says the same as the Old Testament version says, is what it says, right? But we're easier to deceive in that way, easier to deceive. You know, and essentially, a separated believer from the body is as useful as a severed foot is to the body that it came from. Division. Severed foot. Absolutely no use to the body, and the body is no use to the foot if it is separate. And, and, and you know, sometimes this looks easy to an outsider when, you know, you come in, like, you guys give a glorious welcome, I must say. You know, you, you're wonderful hosts. And sometimes it looks easy. But then on a Tuesday at, like, 10 p.m., when we're still sorting out biscuits and timetables and buses and this, that, and the, it don't look so pretty then. <laughs> it doesn't, right? It doesn't. We must not let division come into this body. We must not let division come into this body. You know, only the enemy wins in a scenario like that. God wouldn't want that for us. God absolutely wouldn't want that for us. And it's only when we as daughters put together the whole of the acronym of everything that I've just spoken to you about and walk it out that the reality of the protection of the fortress that is Christ that, that we're, you know, it, that's spoken about in Psalm 91 actually comes together. When we walk in as co-heirs, when we understand and, and we, it's obvious that we have encountered Christ, when we're living victoriously, when we're encouraging one another, when we're, un, you know, when we're living out the redemption of Christ, when we're enduring and persevering, right? <coughs> and when it has depth, it's easy to come and do the Sunday morning thing. He didn't die on a cross for you to be a Sunday morning believer. He didn't die on a cross for that. He didn't die on a cross for that. So how can you enter into a secret place if you don't know where it is? How do you know what to do there unless you know what it's for? And who will be there? And how sweet it is to sit under the protection of the Most High. Couple of things, and I'm going to invite Pastor Vicky up. One, remember who he is and what he did. Remember that there is no separation between you and the secret place. If you didn't know, you can go there anytime. Anytime. The veil that separated it is torn. It's torn. You can't be too dirty, too lost, too broken, too sinful, too shameful to go to that place. Ask him and go. And go. And go. And go. It's as simple as that. I don't have any, you know, I don't have any new Hebrew to bring to you about how to get to the, right? There's not an extra map that Paul wrote that's like, here's how you get to the secret place. Just go. Yeah. Just go. Stop. Rest. Take the time. Go. Go. And know that when you get there, you will absolutely be able to sit in the shadow of the risen king. He will meet you there every single time. Jesus Christ isn't late. He's never late. He will be there every single time, but your feet must take you there. Pastor Vicky, I just want to invite you up to uh, minister a little bit and encourage people, maybe do some, some prayer. That would be amazing. And um, I, I just want to end with a, a little prayer, if you'll allow me. Father God, I just thank you for all of the uh, women and men in this place tonight. And Lord, I just ask that you help us remember that we are covered. We're covered by the blood. We are owned. We are redeemed. Lord, and I just ask that, you know, if you've ministered to anybody in here tonight, that you help them remember it in the morning. Don't let the enemy steal the memory of what your Holy, your Holy Spirit has done in and for people this evening. 
Don't let them forget that in the morning, Lord. Lord, I just exalt you for who you are. I'm grateful for the redemption in my life and in the lives of this body. And I just ask, Lord, that you give us feet to run a marathon, to run a marathon out there for those who don't know you yet. I know what I've been saved from. Lord, help me know what I've been saved for. Who do you need me to go? Where do you need me to go? What do you need me to say? What does it need to look like, Lord? Here I am, send me. Lord, and I just pray that you raise up a body here of believers who go when you ask them to go, who don't argue about the destination or the, the travel distance or the method of travel or how long it's going to... Lord, I pray that you raise up a, a, body, a church here who just go. Just go. And Lord, I pray that you cover them. Give them your anointing. Send the helper, mighty counselor. Counsel their footsteps. Lord, I live my whole life and everybody in this room's life tonight. And Lord, we just say, have your way. Amen. Have your way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Oh, that was...